for the Atlantic Salmon Federation, but here today representing what we call the working group on smallmouth bass eradication in the Miramichi, and we're comprised of seven indigenous and non-government organizations. Our logos are up on the screen. Um, the proponent for the project is the North Shore Mi'kmaq District Council. We work closely with their Aboriginal Aquatic Resource Organization and Quotum. There's the Atlantic Salmon Federation, Miramichi Salmon Association, the Watershed Management Committee, the New Brunswick Salmon Council, and the New Brunswick Wildlife Federation. And collectively, uh, through our, our members, we represent tens of thousands of New Brunswickers who believe in a bright future for the Miramichi. So what are we doing? We're trying to tackle the problem of an illegally introduced invasive species in the upper reaches of the Miramichi watershed, and that's smallmouth bass. I want to be really clear, because we have had a little bit of confusion. We're not talking about striped bass out here on the waterfront. Two, two different but related species. Um, these are a, a freshwater fish native to the Ohio River Valley that have been spread extensively around the world mostly for angling purposes. And in 2008, they were discovered following an illegal introduction in Miramichi Lake, which is a headwater tributary of the southwest branch of the river. Uh, we're proposing to eradicate these fish using a product called Knox Fish, Fish Toxicant 2, with active ingredient rotenone. I'll talk a little bit more about rotenone in a minute, but it's a uh, it's an organic compound derived from the roots of several species of bean plants in South America and the Pacific Rim. It's been used in food fishing for millennia and has been used successfully in fisheries management for problems like this since the 1950s. And the reason why we're here is that the, the future of the watershed turns on the success of this project and we're we're really looking for the support of the river communities through a, a motion from mayor and council. So why are smallmouth such a problem? Uh, first off, the 26 native fish species in the Miramichi watershed have no history with this fish. They haven't co-evolved. They've never coexisted. Um, smallmouth are, are prolific. They're a top predator. They're well adapted to a variety of habitats. Uh, people have the impression, oh, OK, they might spread out and establish themselves in the southwest Miramichi River. But in fact, over time, they'll colonize all of the small streams, the tributaries, the trout lakes that, that people like to visit. It would be slow, but eventually, every single place they can go, they will go and establish themselves. And they, they, they compete for food, they compete for habitat, and they directly consume native species. A risk assessment that DFO did in 2009 concluded that should they establish themselves in the river, there would be a measurable decrease in the abundance of native species. I think we could all agree that Atlantic salmon, sea trout, and the other native species of the Miramichi are under enough pressure and don't need this additional. We're, we're focused not on a single species, um, but the entire ecosystem. Next to habitat destruction, worldwide invasive species are the greatest threat to biodiversity. Their establishment and spread in the Miramichi would permanently alter the ecosystem forever. It would change um, the cultures. It would affect the economy. It's a little bit dated now, but an economic impact analysis that the Atlantic Salmon Federation did in 2012 found there was $18 million of direct spending just on Atlantic salmon angling in the River Valley, and it supports about 630 full-time equivalent jobs. So a, a significant contributor to the local economy. A big question here, what's the current distribution? Um, I, I like this image because they're in that circle. Um, they started in Miramichi Lake, which is at the tip of the arrow. Over time, they've traveled down Lake Brook, which connects to the southwest Miramichi. And we know they're present in about 
13 kilometers of the river. And we've confirmed that distribution through um, molecular analysis, collecting small water samples and analyzing them for the presence of animal DNA, including smallmouth. And then we've ground truthed that molecular analysis with physical surveys, primarily angling and electrofishing. And as of, as of last year, and th this will be repeated this year, but as of last year, that is the current known extent. Just a, 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 I'll go through this quickly. It's just a little bit of background, and I'm conscious of the time. Um, these fish were discovered at Miramichi Lake in 2008. Nobody knows exactly uh, who put them in or when they put them in, but that's the point at which they were discovered. Um, immediately, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, against the urgings of groups like ASF and MSA that were immediately calling for steps to eradicate this fish, while you literally had fish in a barrel in the lake, DFO chose a program of control and containment, and they refused to look at any other options. Uh, citing regulatory constraints was, was one frequent reason that, that we heard. That changed in 2015 when Canada enacted its Aquatic Invasive Species Regulation, which expressly permits the use of rotenone products in fisheries management. So in 2016, our seven groups got together, and our purpose was to lobby the provincial and federal government for a definitive solution to this problem. And after about 18 months of that, we were told that they just wouldn't they wouldn't lead such a project, but would entertain applications from proponents. And that's when it became clear to us we had to take our destiny in our own hands. And in 2019, we started the application process for this. We hear a lot, well, why don't you just go fish them out? Isn't, isn't the use of a chemical a harsh solution? And frankly, it is a harsh solution, but it's the only one that has any reasonable likelihood of success. And in the hundreds and hundreds of cases we've looked at where this has been done around the world, there's no example where the toxicant has persisted in the ecosystem or the ecosystem hasn't recovered. This is, this is a very well understood process and product. You just can't fish them out. You can see in 2010, that's when there was this kind of maximal effort to remove all of those fish from the lake. And the numbers were driven down to a low point in 2012 where less than 50 fish were caught. But as soon as you take your foot off the gas a little bit, you can see the rebound. And most of the fish that are caught, over 90% are young of the year smallmouth bass, which are only about that big. So you, you understand the problem with trying to contain and remove them. It's an impossibility, and it, this, was a, this was a predicted failure, but it kept going anyways. As I said, our groups the whole time since 2008 were calling for the use of this fisheries management tool, wrote known to address the problem before it became worse and before we had this spread initiated. Uh, this has been done, as I said, all over the world hundreds of times. We've, we've brought in the experts. We have people on our team from California, Montana, Idaho, British Columbia, Nova Scotia, um, strong support from the provincial government and the Department of Natural Resources. And these are just a few recent examples in Depre Lake, which is in the headwaters of the Canes. There was chain pickerel introduced. DNR acted quickly and successfully eradicated them. Uh, Windy Lake in BC, I visited that project. It was the, the last of a, a 12 lake eradication program done by the BC Ministry of Environment that kept smallmouth bass and yellow perch out of the Thompson River. And in the fall of 2020 in Nova Scotia, the provincial government acted to eradicate invasive smallmouth bass from a headwater lake of the St. Mary's River. This, the use of rotenone is the most common method of aquatic invasive fish control and eradication worldwide because it is safe and effective. Um, the product that we're intending to use has been reviewed and approved by Health Canada um, at the concentrations at, at which we're using. It's, it's quite toxic to gill-breathing organisms, but virtually 
non-toxic to humans, birds, mammals. And that's another reason why it's favored. It's, it's selectively toxic at incredibly low concentrations to gill-breathing organisms and not to others. So just, uh, we're getting close to the end here, just kind of what the project looks like. Um, there are three main areas where we would be operating, Miramichi Lake, Lake Brook, which connects down to the southwest Miramichi, and then a point um, down about 15 kilometers to where we'll have uh, deactivation using, it, it's, it may be used in your water system here, a chemical called potassium permanganate. It's a common water purification compound. And at the, at the downstream extent of the treatment area, that's applied to the water and it neutralizes the rotenone to prevent unwanted downstream impacts. So last year, we were ready to go. Over two years of regulatory work, we did a provincial environmental impact assessment, a federal assessment. We held 18 permits to carry out this job. And this was all work done by our non-government and indigenous partners. It was an incredibly heavy lift. Uh, we brought together a team of 120 people up in Juniper. Some really important mitigations to the project to minimize uh, negative consequences to non-target species, which basically means everything but smallmouth bass. We built a fish barrier uh, 90 meters across the southwest Miramichi River at Slate Island. So migratory fish coming up couldn't get into the project area. I'll just This is really quick, but it just kind of gives you a sense of the scale of some of the work we were doing. This is on the, this is on the fish barrier. It's the, only, it's the only instance we know of where anyone has been able to put a barrier completely across the main stem of the river. And this thing was a, a massive team effort. The entire conservation and Miramichi indigenous community is, is united behind this project. It doesn't look that hard, but standing up those 200 pound tripods in the, in the current was quite something. You just kind of get a sense of the scale of it there. I'll be quick here. The fish rescue. So not, not only did we build that barrier, but we went through and we sained all the major known holding pools for adult fish, and we transported those fish down below the barrier because fish in the treatment area will, will be affected by the rotenone. So th there will be some non-target impacts, but we're working really hard to minimize that. Just a couple pictures there. Baseline monitoring, our project is backed up by a five-year uh, ecological monitoring study led by Anquotum Resource Management. It's probably the most extensive um, post-treatment monitoring program for any rotenone project that, that we're aware of. We did all the baseline monitoring last year to be ready to go. At deactivation, uh, it's, it's in a remote area. You can see the apparatus there set up on the left. We had to airlift over 8,000 kilograms of supply and materials in there to be ready for it. This was a, pr a pretty fun day, actually. So just drop in the buckets, and then we kind of move them into place, send it back. Um, so we, we build up to all this. We are ready to go. We've got, we've got our rotenone in the boats. We've got drip cans on rocks. We have our 120 people deployed throughout the project area. And we, we showed up to do it, and there were uh, a handful of protesters on the water, uh, women from different New Brunswick Malice communities who were working with a handful of cottage owners on Miramichi Lake that remain opposed to the project. And we, hindsight's perfect, but we didn't see it coming. We had been through a two-year Crown-led Indigenous consultation um, process. Our, this, is, this is an Indigenous non-government partnership, and it, it kind of caught us, and it put a lot of pressure coming down on the decision-making 
structure of our, of our project. We had to pause to figure out, you know, how can we do this if we have people without personal protective equipment who are uh, determined to obstruct the project. We held our crews over in hotels a couple extra days, and then people started to have to leave. It put us over budget, 150,000 bucks. Our, collectively, our, our groups have um, raised and, and spent close to a million and a half dollars on this. And eventually, we just had to put it on, on pause, and we returned to those Malice communities, and, and we, we continue to be engaged in dialogue there today. So just to, just to, to, to recap before my last slide, um, 2021, you know, we built up to the go point. Uh, this, is, this is probably the single largest conservation project in the history of the Miramichi watershed. And you can imagine the disappointment when we didn't let it, when it wasn't able to go through. Um, in 2022, our challenge is to get a different outcome faced with the same set of circumstances. We spent a lot of time last year uh, meeting and speaking with the cottage owners and you know we're never going to be able to change their mind and this year we really want to show people that there is support for this during the environmental impact assessment we had 1292 letters of support set into the provincial government um, in favor of this project so we are we have an execution strategy uh, we are determined to get this done because the future of of the river and to some extent all of the river communities depend on it. And again, that's that's why we're here, hoping for a motion of support from mayor and council of, of the great city of Miramichi. So thank you for listening to my, my presentation. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, very informative and uh, it's a daunting task. It's amazing. Um, is there any questions or comments for Mr. Neville at this time? <laughs> 